Welcome to Fundamentals of Macroeconomics. This chapter, we are discussing unemployment, the labor market problem. Previously, we have discussed the GDP, the total productive capacity of an economy. While this had a lot of value for describing long-run economic progress, in the here and now, the number one thing people care about is whether or not they have enough income from employment to meet their daily needs. So how do you tell whether an economy is doing well? Do the people have jobs who want them? One of the most popular measures for this is the unemployment rate. But how do you measure it? The government goes out to thousands and thousands of households and asks them. The Bureau of Labor Statistics performs this survey, and with the data collected, they estimate the current unemployment status. The BLS also conducts a survey on establishments, on the businesses, and measures how many jobs are on their payroll. And on the first Friday of every month, they release this data to the public, showing how many new jobs on net were created this month and what the unemployment rate is. The household survey calculates the unemployment rate, whereas the establishment survey says how many new jobs were created, among many other measures the report provides. In order to get at a more informative unemployment rate, we want to focus on the proportion of the population that is most relevant to the job market. So first and foremost, we don't want to include children under the age of 16. If a 15 year old does not have a job, they can simply go play more Call of Duty. And this is generally considered a socially healthy thing to do. We also look at the civilian non-institutionalized population. So those who are in prison or in full-time nursing care or active duty in the military are not part of the dynamic labor market. And then among these adults, we have those who are in the labor force and those who are not in the labor force. The labor force is defined as those who have a job. This is any job. It could be a part-time job, full-time job, anything. And then those who are unemployed, which in the year 2022 was just less than 6 million people. So who would not be considered in the labor force? Number one, the retired. They're living the good life. We don't want them to work. That's a good thing. We shouldn't count them. And the other big component are stay-at-home adults, either a stay-at-home spouse or a stay-at-home parent, still often working in the domestic sphere, doing household production such as cooking, renovating, maintenance, landscaping, and the all-important raising the next generation. Or, if they're lucky enough, they can simply spend the whole time in pure leisure. Again, this is a good thing, most often done by choice, and should not be part of a standard measure of unemployment. So the official unemployment rate is taking the total number of people unemployed, and we define that as those who have access actively looked for work in the past four weeks, and then divide that by the size of the labor force. That is, the total unemployed people plus the total employed people. We plug in some numbers for this, 5.99 million divided by 164 million, and we get 3.6%. But one number is not going to tell the whole story. Some of those people not in the labor force might not necessarily be there by choice. So we might also be interested to know the labor force participation rate. That is, take the total size of the labor force and divide it by the civilian non-institutional population, sometimes called the working age population. And in the United States, in the year 2022, that number was 62%. So you can think about this as 62% of the available adult population to work is actively inside the labor force, either having a job or actively looking for a job. At the time of the recording, the current unemployment rate is 3.8% and has been hovering at that level for a year and a half. The pandemic yielded the highest unemployment rate that we've seen since the Great Depression at 14.7%. The previous decade was characterized as a slow decline in the unemployment rate or a slow improvement in the labor market. The Great Financial Crisis saw a peak unemployment rate at 10% in October 2009. And it wasn't so much the peak that made things terrible, but just how long the unemployment rate remained elevated. Here we are September 2013, almost five years later. 7.2%. Better, but still historically high. The gray bars below represent recessions, and during recessions we see the unemployment rate rise. The dot-com recession in 2001 saw the unemployment rate go from around 4% up to nearly 6%. In 1991, we saw the savings and loans banking crisis lead to a recession and an unemployment rate of 7.7%. The double-dip recession of the early 80s has come under interest lately. This was a recession largely manufactured by the Federal Reserve in order to combat the decades-long severe inflation that they had experienced previously. And although it peaked quite severely in late 1982, their recovery over the decade was steep. The recessions in the 70s were caused by oil disruptions, either by OPEC tightening in 74 or the Iranian Revolution in 79. And we see in the 1950s and 60s, recessions were more frequent, but also quite short. Not everybody in the country experiences the same unemployment rate. This graph breaks it up by age. Teenagers by far have the highest unemployment rate in red. They peaked at 26% in December 2019 and are nearly always in the double digit range. Young adults aged 20 to 24 have the next highest in the light green. 
the blue is the national average, and then the purple represents age 55 and older. As we can see, the older you are, the more experience and tenure you have in the workplace, the lower your unemployment rate. We also see a wide variance based upon race. African Americans experience the highest unemployment rate, followed by Hispanics and Latinos, the national average, and then whites slightly below that. But as we could see over the decades, there mostly is a difference in the levels. Across society during a recession, the unemployment rate goes up. And then as the economy improves, across society, the unemployment rate goes down. Education levels strongly affect someone's likelihood to have a job. In the purple, those with less than a high school diploma experienced by far one of the highest unemployment rates. During a very strong labor market in 2019, those without a high school diploma had an unemployment rate of 5.6% compared to the national average of 3.6%. In red, those who are high school graduates experience similar to the national average, and in green, those with a bachelor's degree experience a significantly lower unemployment rate compared to the average. At the peak of the Great Financial Crisis, while the country was experiencing an average double-digit unemployment rate, those with a bachelor's degree only peaked at 4.9%. And then down in the blue line, those with a doctorate degree have the lowest unemployment rate of all, and we can see they're largely recession-proof. There's not much up and down during a crisis. One area where we have seen tremendous progress is the division in unemployment rate between men and women. Previously, in the 1960s and 1970s, we can see on average women had a higher unemployment rate in the green line compared to men in the red line, whereas by the 1980s and 90s, those gaps were much smaller. The financial crisis had a higher unemployment rate for men. This was largely driven by the tremendous bust in construction jobs, which are more heavily dominated by men. And zooming into the COVID years, women experienced a slightly higher unemployment rate. This was mostly driven by stay-at-home schooling, less professional childcare options requiring more parents to stay at home. But those effects were temporary. By January 22, we see equality between the genders. That's at least looking at those who are actively looking for work. Over the past 50 years, we've seen dramatic changes in the share of women participating in the labor market. We can see the rise in the labor force participation rate for women in blue. There has been a slight decline in the labor force participation rate of men over this period. Some of this is driven by more stay-at-home dads, but a lot of it is driven by men retiring earlier than they used to. This is a good thing. And it is still the case today that men have a higher labor force participation rate at 62% compared to women at 57.7%. I want to make one last point about measuring the labor market. The official unemployment rate only counts those who have been actively looking for work sometime in the past four weeks. Occupation. Gladiator. Did you kill last week? No. Did you try to kill last week? Yeah. Now listen, this is your last week of unemployment insurance. Either you kill somebody next week or we're going to have to change your status. You got it? Yeah. Sign. What about those people who are discouraged? They may have looked for work in the past six months, but haven't looked lately because they've given up. But if they were presented a job, they'd come into the market. What about other people who are working part-time, but really would rather be working full-time? but can't because the economy is sluggish. These people matter too, and so the BLS counts them. Specifically, they have six different measures of the unemployment rate, the formal definitions here. The official one, which we've been defining in this video, is U3, and the most expansive one is U6. It includes the total unemployed, plus all persons marginally attached to the labor force, plus total employed part-time for economic reasons as a percent of the total labor force. And as you would expect, in blue, this U6 measure is going to be larger than the official measure, which is red in this particular graph. So while the official measure peaked at 10% in October 2009, the U6 measure peaked at 17.1%. The official measure peaked at 147 during COVID, whereas the U6 measure peaked at 22.9%. But notice both measures go up at the same time and go down at the same time. So while we have a lot of interest in measuring all of these things, the official rate is going to tell us a lot about the relative health of the labor market. Tune into the next video where we will be discussing what causes the unemployment rate and how we can address it.